Last year, uh, this group of gentlemen right here received a $41 million settlement in a court case surrounding a crime that was committed a little more than 25 years ago that at the time Mayor Ed Koch had called the crime of the century. So how did these dudes manage to collect such a fat paycheck? Well, back in 1989, this woman here, Trisha Miley, went out for an evening run through Central Park at about 9 p.m., which she'd done many other times before. But on this particular night, a group of more than 30 young men were also headed to the park with plans to randomly assault and terrorize anybody unlucky enough to be there at the park at the time. So at about one in the morning, a couple of men, unfortunately, found Trisha unconscious, covered in mud and blood uh, in a ravine. And she'd been brutally beaten beyond recognition. She'd been taken advantage of, and she was left for dead. She had lost almost 80% of her blood in this attack, if you can imagine that. It's unbelievable. And she was in a coma for 12 days. Well, as Trisha clung to life there in this New York hospital, police arrested five young men who became known as the Central Park Five, who were eventually charged and convicted of the crime and sent off to prison. One of them you can see here actually came to play on a, on a show called Family Matters. You see Aunt Urkel there on the top right? <laughs> Not really. Anyway, these guys were eventually charged and convicted of the crime, and they were hauled off to prison. Not because of eyewitness testimony or because somebody pointed them out in a lineup, not because they had any physical DNA or evidence that connected them to the scene of the crime, but because all five of these boys confessed that they were the ones who did it. And so justice was served, and they got the punishment that they deserved. But the only problem is they didn't do it. This guy here, Matia, uh, Matias Reyes, a convicted murderer and rapist, he confessed to authorities that he was the one who assaulted Trisha, and he also said the, he acted absolutely alone. And so the case was reopened, and DNA um, evidence, in fact, proved that Matias was telling the truth, and those five young men were serving time for a crime that they didn't commit. And so their prison terms were vacated, and they received that fat $41 million settlement, a million bucks for each year that they collectively served in the penitentiary. And they're not even done collecting money. Right now, they're currently going to court trying to get another $52 million for the pain and suffering that they endured. Now, that's a lot of money. But like their attorney said, no amount of money can make up for the pain and suffering that these men and their family and loved ones experienced over the last 25 years of their incarceration. And you can't help but feel bad for the guys. But at the same time, isn't it kind of like their fault in the first place? Why'd they cop to those charges if they were innocent? You know, they'd been accused of crimes they knew they didn't commit, they knew that there was going to be serious consequences and repercussions if they were, in fact, convicted of those crimes. And yet they confessed their guilt anyway. And they suffered needlessly because of that. Now, why would they do that? Well, apparently it happens more often than you think. I watched an episode of 60 Minutes, which is what got me thinking on this whole subject here, where they actually talked about how Chicago at one time was known as the confession capital of the world. They had become so no notorious for false confessions. In fact, the mayor at the time, um, he took the death sentences of 167 death row inmates and reduced them to life sentences because there were so many concerns about false confessions securing wrongful convictions. So it's a real concern, and a lot of research has been done to try to get to the heart of why it is that people would be stupid enough to confess to crimes that they didn't commit. And it really just boils down to two things. Now, I read this great article from a, God bless you, is that a sneeze? You all right, you need some water? 
Somebody get the girl some water. Anyway. Uh, so anyway, there's this great article from this professor of psychology named Saul Kasson, who spent the last 30 years studying cases in which there were false confessions that were made that led to uh, prison terms, some cases even death sentences. And he says that there's only two types of confessions. Listen what, to listen what he says here. The first one he says is called coerced compliant confessions. That's a lot of words, but he's going to explain. These are cases like the Central Park Five where innocent people, innocent people who know that they're innocent, become so stressed, so broke down, so confused as to what their best means of escape is that they confess fully knowing they're innocent. Okay, that makes sense. If I, if I was being grilled under hot lights, if I was being beaten and threatened within an inch of my life, I would probably cop to some false charges too. So that's easy to understand. But it's the second type of false confession that I found particularly interesting and that I think speaks to a spiritual truth that many of us as Christians experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So listen to this next type of conviction, uh, confession, false confession with spiritual ears, okay? Listen to this. The other type of confession, he says, is what we call coerced, internalized false confessions. Okay, what's that? These are cases where individuals, again, knowing they're innocent, these cases where individuals actually come to believe in their own guilt as a result of lies and their suggestibility. And in almost every single false confession case I've ever seen, the presence of false evidence is impl implicated and it's almost always the straw that breaks the innocent suspect's back. So what does the Central Park Five and false confessions have to do with us? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to explain, but I'm going to need you to take out a pen and paper that's in front of your seat there because I'm going to be sharing a lot of scripture with you today that I'll want you to look at later on. So you have to be patient. You ready to look into God's word this morning? I hope you are. So what do false confessions have to do with us? This. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Many of you know that scripture by heart. What that scripture means that is that if we are in Christ, we don't have to live in fear of God's wrath or his anger or his judgment or his punishment. In fact, the punishment that we deserve for breaking God's laws and all of his commandments fell on Jesus when he stepped in and received the death penalty for crimes that we committed. We were the ones who were guilty as charged, and yet Jesus took that penalty that we deserved upon himself. And look at what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 with regard to that. And so he canceled the charges of our legal indebtedness. He canceled the charges that stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away nailing it to the cross. And so as far as God is concerned, you and I in Christ are holy, blameless, and faultless in his sight. Now it's definitely, that's hard to believe, but those are the exact words that the apostle Paul uses to describe you and I as we stand in Christ. I'll read them to you. Look, it's black and white here. Colossians 1 verse 22 where it says that God has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy, blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. I love the way the NIV translates it. It says that you are without blemish and you and I are free from accusation. You're free from accusation. You're holy, you're blameless, you're faultless. Now that sounds absolutely unbelievable when we consider our thoughts and our behaviors from one day to the next because we know how often we kill it, especially when we measure ourselves against God's word like we did last weekend. But in spite of our behavior from one day to the next, it's absolutely true. True. 
And that amazing truth should set us free. It should set us free from fear, from guilt, from anxiety and shame and condemnation once and for all. Okay. But here's where I think that we're kind of like the Central Park Five. So many of us suffer needlessly living in bondage to fear, shame, anxiety, and condemnation for years because we cop to false charges and accusations that are leveled against us by the one described in the book of Revelation as the accuser of the brethren. We just read here, in black and white, that as believers, we are free from condemnation and we are free from accusation. The penalty for our sin has been paid in full by Jesus Christ and the charges that stood against us are now taken away. They were nailed to the cross. And yet the Bible says that in spite of the fact that we're free from accusation, the devil accuses us day and night, relentlessly bringing charges against the people of God. And he uses false evidence and deception to convince us, the holy, blameless, and righteous people of God, that we are in fact guilty, condemned, unacceptable, and unlovable. And sometimes, under the pressure of those accusations and the grilling of those hot lights, we crumble and we agree to the false charges that have been made against us by the accuser. And we end up making coerced, internalized, false confessions where we come to believe in our own guilt as a result of lies. And one of the biggest lies that the enemy uses to coerce you and I into making these false confessions is what I want to talk with you about today for the next little bit that we're here together this morning. And that is this. It's Satan's lie. It's what he lies to us about. It's that our behavior from one day to the next define who we are. Our performance from one day to the next, whether good or bad, defines who we are. That's a lie. That's not true, and we believe it. Now, let me explain this here for a minute. You guys okay? All right. You've heard this a number of times over the last several weeks, particularly as we we're going through our Who Am I series, that you and I are a work in progress. In other words, you and I are going to make very poor choices from time to time. Even as Bible-believing Christians, you and I are going to deliberately sin. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 8 that if you say that you're without sin, you're full of it. Because that's my paraphrase. We're all going to sin. All of us, as we learned last week, are going to sin. And when we, when we eventually do, we should feel bad about it. Guilt, like pain and like fear, can be a good, healthy thing. Guilt is what hopefully keeps you and I from making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. So guilt is good. Without it, you're a sociopath. But it's important for us to know and believe that God doesn't want us to live in a constant state of guilt as a result of the mistakes and poor choices that we make. You know, there's a time when the Apostle Paul had to come down pretty hard on the Corinthian church because their behavior, they were just off the hook. I can't even tell you what they were doing because there's kids in here. Read 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 7 and see what these people were doing. But he came down really hard on the Corinthian church and those people experienced a significant amount of guilt because of their sin. Paul refers to it not as guilt, but as godly sorrow. And we're going to read about it here in a second. But he says that Godly sorrow is only intended to last for a little while in order to show us the error of our ways and hopefully then take us into a different direction. Now, I want us to read about it. Uh, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. I'm going to have it up here on the screen for you. Listen to this. He says, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you where I brought up 50 shades of gray and Magic Mike. If you weren't here last week, you don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. But now I'm glad I sent it, 
not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have. For the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. And then I love the way the message version translates the uh, verses 11 and 12, where it says, now look, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this godly sorrow has pushed you closer to God? You're more alive. You're more concerned. You're more sensitive. You're more reverent. You're more human, more compassionate. You're more responsible. You've come out of this with purity of heart, and that is what I was hoping for in the first place when I wrote that letter. See, that is the kind of productive guilt or godly sorrow that God wants to, us to experience whenever it is that we sin. It's healthy, but it's also, again, it's supposed to be temporary, and it should always lead us to that place of confession that we read about in 1 John 1, 9, where it says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so what I'm trying to drive home right here, this point, is that I want you and I to see and realize that godly sorrow is good. And confession and repentance play a very important role in the life of a believer. So I want us to understand that. But there's a huge difference between the healthy confession and a constructive godly sorrow that we just read about and a false confession that, me, that we make when we believe the lies that our negative behavior defines who we are. It's the subtle difference between guilt and shame. We often use those two words interchangeably, but there is a subtle difference between guilt and shame. The best quote I've heard on the matter is from a guy named John Bradshaw in this book called The Family, where he says this, listen, guilt says, I've done something wrong. Shame says, there is something wrong with me. Guilt says I've made a mistake. Shame says I am a mistake. Guilt says what I did was not good. Shame says I am no good. When we inevitably fail, when we sin, the strategy of the accuser is to get us to believe things like I am worthless, I am stupid, I'm a loser, I'm unlovable, I'm a failure, I can never change, and the list goes on and on and on. You ever say those things to yourself? I do. And when we make negative confessions like that, and that's what those are, they're negative, false confessions, it leads to all sorts of bondage, bondage to fear, bondage to anxiety, bondage to depression and shame and hopelessness and guilt, it leads to more sin, which inevitably leads to destructive consequences. My little brother Ricky is a prime example of this. Uh, I've, brought, I've talked about my brother before. He was living homeless on the streets of Sacramento. We've tried very hard to extend help to him. At a certain point, he finally, he doesn't even return our calls or any of that. He just stopped, even my mom, he wouldn't even call my mom back. Well, he finally called her back. You know why? He got locked up again. He got locked up again. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to my little brother. My mom did. And she asked him what his trip was. What's going on with you? She asked him, how is it you're caught up in this stuff again? What happened, Ricky? And I found it very sad to hear that what it amounts to is a whole lot of false confessions that my brother Ricky is making to himself. He says stupid things. Well, I can't change. Nobody loves or cares about me anyway. Life sucks. It always is going to suck. And those false confessions that my brother continues to make led to a very literal prison. 
of his own making. And it's heartbreaking, particularly to watch my mama go through that again. Listen to this quote from this clinical psychologist. It's not a Christian book, but listen to what he says. is very, it's very true, particularly in light of what I just said about my brother. What you believe, what you and I believe to be the truth about ourselves, what you believe to be the truth about you, the value that you place on you as an individual controls your destiny and the quality of your existence throughout life. True that. I'm not sure if the author knows it or not, but that is actually a biblical principle that we read about in the book of Proverbs where King Solomon says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I'm going to tell you right now, Google it because apparently I have the wrong, the, that's not the right scripture reference. That's something about a dog and vomit and something else. So whatever. <laughs> that's a good one too, but that's not what I was trying to get at. As a man thinks in his heart, as a man or as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. That is so true. So we've got to stop believing that our behavior or our circumstances or our feelings or what other people say about us or what we say about ourselves defines who we are. I wonder what Ricky's life would be like if he actually believed what we read about earlier that he is acceptable, that he's loved, that he really is faultless and blameless in the eyes of God. What would Ricky's life be like? As we learned in our Who Am I series, God says that we are defined by who God says we are. And what does God say we are? He says we are a new creation. He says that we're no longer defined by our past or by our dumb behavior or by our occupation or by our family history or whatever or by our feelings none of that we are defined by the reality that in spite of our circumstances in spite of our feelings in spite of when our heart condemns us or when the accusations come relentlessly from the enemy in spite of all that we are defined by how god sees us as holy blameless faultless and free from accusations. We've got to start believing that. I've got to start believing that. I think just yesterday it was, Charlene says, babe, you beat yourself up so much. I just really do. So I need this message as much as anybody. Okay, so what do we do with all this? It's a lot of great theology there, but I want us to leave here doing something with all this knowledge. So here's Three quick things, and I'm wrapping it up. First of all, some of you might need to admit to somebody that you love that you have hurt them, you've harmed them, you've sinned against them. Some of you might right now be sitting next to your spouse and you're so ticked off at them right now for something they did last Tuesday. Are you, who is, is somebody in here like that? I bet some. Don't raise your hand, but I just know there's somebody like that in here. So this is for you. Listen, I see so many marriages and relationships that fall apart, that are broken, because people are just not willing to admit that they are wrong, that they are the one that is the source of all the pain that they're experiencing in that relationship. They don't want to admit or confess that they have sinned against somebody it's not right especially as christ believers in second corinthians chapter 5 the apostle paul says that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation which means yes we're trying to tell people they need to be reconciled to god but as christ followers we need to be people of of peace who are trying to bring peace to relationships between ourselves and others, between ourselves and our enemies. And it has to begin with us. We need to own that. We got to be the first one. I always do with Charlene. Why do I always have to be the first one to apologize? I hate that. Most of the time because it's me. Oh, man, I hate preaching to my own self. <laughs> 
there's been, in fact, many times when Charlene and I have experienced a tremendous amount of distance between us because, you know, I've done something to harm or hurt her, and, you know, I'm not always willing to apologize. Sometimes, you know, you might do this as couples, I'll just try to kiss her or give her a hug, right, or more. But, you know, and you're just like, that's going to make it all better. Like, there, see, now it's all better, right, honey? No, it's not. It might get us back on speaking terms, but it doesn't do anything to bring us back into an intimate relationship. We can be in the same house, the same bed, on the same couch, and we're miles apart from each other. And so, some of us need to go and confess to somebody that we killed it. It's my fault. It's not your fault. I'm not going to wait for you to apologize because it's me. We need to be doing that. And so there's one takeaway. I hope that some relationship in your life is restored because you had the courage to be able to say, it's me. In the same way, some of us may need to confess our sins to the Father. Just like in any other relationship, whether it's me and Charlene or you and your spouse or some other loved one, where there's an offense that hasn't been resolved, there's going to be distance. Now, you have to believe this, and this is what I believe. God doesn't leave you. He's sovereignly chosen you before the foundation of the world. He's not leaving you. He chose you. Uh, I don't believe God's on a swivel chair where he's like, you know, he's looking at you. I love you so much. Oh, now you're killing it. See ya. And then he just, I don't believe he does that. A lot of people say, well, you know, but God can't be in the presence of sin. Come on, man. In the Garden of Eden, God was in the presence of sin. There were Adam and Eve and all their nakedness and all their sin and shame. And it was like, he goes, oh, I, you know, I can't see this. He was there with them. So anyway, that's just a rabbit trail. Just to say that God does not leave you or forsake you. There's a perceived distance, though, sometimes. A great chasm that seems to stand between us and God. We're like, is he even here? And sometimes that's caused because of our unconfessed sin. We, we've, done, we've wronged him. We've broken his laws and his commandments and we haven't even acknowledged that we've done anything wrong. Well, guess what? That's going to bring a conviction. That's, gonna, that's where your heart begins to condemn you. But as we read in 1 John 1, 9, the great, glorious, wonderful news is that if you confess with your mouth, you confess these sins and say... God, I acknowledge that I've done wrong. I see that I need to move into a different direction, and I'm sorry. If you confess, then guess what? He's faithful and just, it said in 1 John 1, 9, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so as soon as we do that, as soon as we do the work of confessing our sin, intimacy and fellowship are restored and guilt is washed away. That godly sorrow that the Apostle Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, that godly sorrow has done the work that God had intended it to do. And now hopefully we move in a different direction and we're not stupid and we just keep doing the same things over and over again, right? And then thirdly, this is the last thing here. Some of you need to receive this forgiveness that I'm talking about here. Some of you have been walking around with guilt and shame for decades because you did something back in 1971. I wasn't even born yet. But some of you are still suffering for sins that you committed way back in the day. And so people drink themselves. Drink, like they start drinking to numb the pain, right? Or it leads to drug addiction. You're just trying to numb the shame and the pain and the guilt that you've experienced from sin that you've committed long ago. And that's just accusations from the enemy. And so you need to receive the forgiveness that God is extending to you and let that guilt wash away. It was never intended to be permanent. Hopefully you've learned whatever it was that God was trying to teach you through that, but you shouldn't live in a constant state of shame. And so some of you need to understand and believe right now that God loves you. He is not mad at you for what you did 20 years ago, this week, last night, or even this morning. He's not mad at you. He loves you. And in Christ, he sees you as faultless, blameless, 
and free from accusation. And so let's commit to stop making false confessions that lead to bondage. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, guys.